morning. Good morning. <laughs> okay, I hope everybody's here now. Um, Aliyah. I feel that it's not trying, but <laughs> I am. <laughs> because of me. Well, apologies for the name does not fit with the face. I'm using uh, my colleague's computer to connect. Okay, great. great. Thank you. Okay, then I think if everybody um, is here, then ah, yes. we can start. Um, yeah. Where is it? Can you connect? Can you get it from your computer? <laughs> yes, I will. Okay, so then because it's 11, I think uh, we can already start. Um, first of all, let me very warmly welcome you all um, on behalf of Vocal Europe and um, ah. of EOBUS to this webinar on the topic of uh, freedom of press. Hey. <laughs> I am Julia, a policy researcher, and I will moderate um, through this event today. But first of all, I would like to give the floor to uh, Monsieur Henri Malos, who is the president of the Jean Monnet Association and the chairman of Focal Europe. Yes. Uh, hello. Good morning, everybody. I hope you can see me correctly and listen to me. Uh, so I'm uh, delighted to, to give a first uh, opening remarks for this session. Uh, I think the question of freedom of the media, freedom of expression, uh, is becoming a more and more uh, urgent and passionate issue these days. Uh, we were used to see a ban of media and the freedom of press in the authoritarian regimes, dictatorship, of course, just uh, think about China. Uh, but we see that now in our democratic system, we face the situation, it happened uh, just yesterday in Germany, where the authorities uh, are tempted to ban some media because they think that they bring disinformation or because they think that uh, they are not, uh, as I say, politically correct. So this makes this uh, question really sensitive. In the case of Ukraine, because Ukraine is a country uh, uh, who has uh, made the choice of uh, democracy and a European model. But in the same time, we saw recently some, some decision uh, who could be interpreted as a kind of ban of uh, freedom of press uh, because of the question of uh, disinformation. This is why we are very happy to have during this debate uh, uh, the Council of Europe. Because for me, for the Germany Association, Vocal Europe, all the Europeans consider Europe is a kind of standard for, for all of us, uh, as it is its foundation just after the Second World War, and because of its reputation uh, for, for human rights uh, and for the question of uh, freedom of expression. This is why I think uh, our, our webinar is a, is a crucial importance, uh, and I hope that we get some interesting reflections. So thank you very much, and I give you the, the floor, Julia, again. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, of course, I, I would also address some welcoming remarks um, to everybody. Um, maybe first of all, let me um, repeat again that you're all very welcome to turn on your cameras because this will be recorded, and it's um, yeah nicer for later if we see all your friendly and happy faces. <laughs> um, so thank you very much uh, for that, for turning the camera on. So as Mr. Malos already pointed out, um, a free and uh, diverse um, media is essential to a function in democracy indeed. And free media is as the fourth estate, in fact, a bulwark of the rule of law and a precondition for citizens' participation in a society. And hence the freedom of the press is also a fundamental value to the European Union. And it is also one of the main challenges uh, facing EU enlargement countries due to persisting political interference in the media or violence or sanctions against journalists or media outlets. So in today's webinar, we intend to discuss the value of uh, freedom of the media and of the press. And we would also like to identify challenges um, that are linked to its guarantee by also looking, as Mr. Mello said, at the case of Ukraine, the recent persecution of some parts of the opposition and independent Russian-speaking TV channels have raised concerns. 
So we look very much forward to discuss this uh, with our experts here today, with our guest speakers, but also with the audience. Um, so this webinar is structured into three blocks. We will start with views from two institutions. So we and I am very pleased to be joined today by um, Ms. Arzita Abdio, head of the Division Corporation on Freedom of Expression from the Council of Europe, and also by Mr. Nestor Shufrich, Chair of the Committee of Freedom of Expression from the Ukrainian Parliament from the Rada. This will be our first block. In our second block, uh, we welcome um, some guest speakers from European and Ukrainian media landscape, some journalists uh, for the views from the media section. Uh, we have um, Ms. Nadia Zas, who's a media host uh, for the first independent TV. Welcome to you. Uh, Ms. Alexandra Kashenko, she's a correspondent uh, for the internet paper strana.ua. Welcome to you as well. Um, then a very warm welcome also to Ms. Elia Papajaju. She's the vice president of the Association of European Journalists. And um, also Mr. Gerard de Grande, who is a journalist and the co-founder of Free Story in Belgium. Um, thank you for being here. Hello. Um, and last but not least, in the third block, let me welcome um, for our political perspective from the European Union, the MEP, Mr. Mick Wallace. Hello, Mr. Wallace. Thank you for being here. I heard there were some troubles in the European Parliament. Um, great that you um, made it. He's from the city and from the AFID committee from the European Parliament. So welcome to you all. Um, just right before we jump into it, I just want to uh, point out that our guest speakers should have approximately um, yeah, 10 to 12 minutes. I will mind the time. Um, if I see that we are exceeding a little bit, I will give you a sign. So no worries, I will, uh, yeah, I will wind the time. And for the audience, you are, of course, most welcome to ask questions. Uh, we will have a Q&A session at the very end. So either you keep the questions uh, for yourself and you ask them at the end, or you can also write them in the chat. I can collect them and ask them, of course, also on your behalf at the very end, uh, as you prefer. Okay, so then, um, yeah, let's just uh, start directly. And I'm very happy to give the floor uh, to Ms. Ebdio from the Council of Europe. Good morning, everybody, again. I'm sorry for the, the troubled entry in the system. Um, I will be sharing a screen, although I do not know if we are allowed to. Uh, this Usually you are allowed. Mm -hmm. Good. I think I have requested that, but if it's taking time... not will send to everybody by email actually it's a summary of the of the discussion yeah today so uh, from our side but I think, Julia, we can, we can start yeah. and I will Please send start. it to um, email. Usually it should work. I'm really sorry. I already gave you the permission. I don't know why it's not working. Please just start. If, uh, yeah. if something changes, I will um, let you know. Okay. Thanks. Well, very nice to be here today. Thank you, everybody, uh, for inviting me to, to address issues of media and uh, media and conflict as, as a component on freedom of, of expression uh, from the Council of Europe side. I'm Ardita Abdu and I work as the head of the Division for Cooperation on Freedom of Expression at the Information Society Department, a part of a, a large directorate gen general in the Council of Europe, keeping an eye on the cooperation activities, but which are always led by the standard setting processes and also monitoring uh, and evaluations of the Council of Europe vis-a-vis -vis its standards that are uh, established through the treaty law and instruments um, produced through the, its own organs. Now, uh, initially, I had I had in my PowerPoint an addressing of like issues I will be speaking today, and I'll start first with the with the importance of the media role, um, and also that media itself, and vis a vis the freedom of expression, as as one of the paramount of the um, uh, of the freedom and and, and society. When talking about media and conflict, it is important to look at the role of media and its actors 
in our society today, and that is strongly linked with the right to the society of exercising the freedom of expression and access to information. Those two are very crucial for the functioning of democracy and its society's uh, rule of law. A precondition for democracy where the council continues to show an unwavering commitment to the protection and promotion of the freedom of expression. We all know very well these days that Article 10 of the European Convention on Human Rights guarantees the right to hold opinions and to impart and receive information and ideas to all persons within the jurisdiction of its member state, and that is of the Council of Europe. Particular importance is attached also from the Council of Europe to the political expression and the debates on matters of public importance. In this context, the media play a vital watchdog role. They oversee public affairs and political structures. Whether that is printed or radioed or aired, till televised or online, they are the means through which most of people receive news and information on issues of public interest. That's the importance that media and journalists must enjoy an environment which is favorable to the exercise of their activities is the highest of the level for Council of Europe, but also when looking at it in the institutional protection that we get involved with. As stated by the Secretary General of the Council of Europe on its annual report of 2021, states should provide an enabling and pluralistic environment in which all media can operate on an equal footing. No media outlet or conglomerate should enjoy unfair competitive advantages. Ownership, management and financial structures should be transparent and public service media should be independent and adequately funded. And this comes after not just a year, but after years of work of the Council of Europe in identifying also and measuring the threats that point out to a certain list of issues that we see as at risk. And these are as a list, but not limited to media's independence, transparency in ownership, disinformation, hate speech, safety of journalists, media pluralism, quality of journalism, media governance, inclusion and diversity in media, media in times of health crisis, and the digital governance. The Secretary General's annual report shows how during 2018 and 2020, respect for freedom of expression has declined in many countries, and it has been aggravated by the COVID-19 crisis as well. The COVID-19 brought a wave of censorship to many countries, and there were reports of journalists suffering reprisals for questioning government policies and of some op uh, oppositional and non-mainstream voices being silenced. Also, the benefits of the digital, digital transformation have been diminished by the negative phenomena associated with the rise of digital platforms. These developments have affected public trust in media and information. Continuous and increasing challenges posed by the crisis of COVID, but these days also of the vaccination and its processes and dissemination of information, have seen an increased violence against journalists, fake news, economic difficulties, and media outlets restrictions with access to information, as well as difficulties in keeping the right balance when protecting personal data. The Council of Europe's platform to promote the protection of journalism and safety of journalists has locked 118 attacks on physical integrity and journalists ex across Europe in 2020. There were also several instances of large scale blocking of websites in a number of countries. And all these issues are not only addressed by the list I, I, I presented earlier, they are also addressed and seen as reflected in the monitoring and the Court of Human Rights decisions uh, when referring to certain years and numbers. For example, the European Court of Human Rights found violations of the Human Rights Convention in 237 cases out of 263, and those were only on freedom of expression. These cases were from 2018 and 2020. That is why in her annual report, of 21, the Secretary General 
refers to the situation for the member states as that states now face a choice. They can continue to permit or facilitate this democratic backsliding, or they can work together to reverse this trend, to reinforce and renew European democracy and to create an environment in which human rights and the rule of law flourish. The Council of Europe thus stands very much up for the independence of media, including service media, which are an important public source of unbiased information and diverse political opinions. The mechanisms enabling the promotion of the values of the Council of Europe are based on a triangular methodology of the Council of Europe. We have been explaining the triangle of the Council of Europe for many years, and we never actually mentioned much often the fact that in addition to the triangle where we have the standards, the monitoring, and the cooperation and assistance activities and actions, we do have a very insurance blanket, and that is the steering of the processes from the political side of it, including those that are carried out from the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe and the Committee of Ministers. Those have the political stick vis-à-vis -vis the member states of the Council of Europe. And when the organization puts in place several instruments, it provides also the guiding tools vis-à-vis -vis these instruments and the treaty law that already exists. And in view of that, it's to address mainly issues and challenges which are mainly deriving from politicized media, level of their independence, transparency in ownership, pluralism, toleran tolerance and diversity, as well as financial independence and financial sustainability associated with the residue of the pandemics, crisis, conflicts, and a declined economic development. Among these are those that regulate disinformation. And I had prepared a list on the PowerPoint, but I'll do, I will be sending it to everyone. Hate speech, protecting journalists, media pluralism, quality journalism, digital governance, media governance, and ensuring independence and functioning of the regulatory authorities for the broadcasting sector. These are the chapters of a series of standards that the Council of Europe provides through its conventions, treaties, and through also recommendations and declarations of the Committee of Ministers and resolutions issued also by PACE, Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. When we look at all these standards and all these compilations that we make available at for our member states, we also never should forget the guidelines and the toolkits and, and all the elements that we provide on their way, how these are implemented, but also monitored in terms of any impact expectation. And overall, overall uh, this, this set of um, standards and instruments, we do have the European Court of Human Rights, which is the only one that has been looking at the cases on, on not only country by country cases, but also looking at the trends and providing the guidance through its court decisions vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the standards of the Council of Europe. Article 10, and especially paragraph 2 of the European Convention on Human Rights, sets out the legitimate aims that restrictions to freedom of expression and media have to be followed. These include the protection of national security, territorial integrity or public safety, the prevention or disorder of crime, the protection of health or morals, and the protection of rights of others. However, in our order to comply with the convention, such measures must be in addition to be necessary in a democratic society and the context of the proportional to the purpose they are supposed to serve. The case law of the court provides important guidance in this respect, and not only for one country, as I said before, but for different countries. When Article 10 of the ECHR applies, the court has examined always the legality and the necessity of the measures at stake in a democratic society, stressing that the free flow of information and the opinions included can, that can offend and disturb must be in principle allowed, whereas an economic sanction or other measures against media organizations or individuals which amount of broadcasting bans or blocking of all websites will appear to comply with the requirement of Article 10, Paragraph 2, are only if there is credible evidence 
that there was no other means of achieving the same end, and that would interfere less seriously with the fundamental right of the freedom of expression. The case law of the European, uh, European Court of Human Rights provides guidance on the states, how and when they are in charge of licensing of a broadcasting, for example, and can under certain conditions issue bans, regulate content and impose sanctions, but always decisions on issuing or revoking as well as fines and bans are taken always in a, sanction, in a way that they have to be proving that all the criteria has been filled as required by the case law. The court has found in several cases that a wall sale of blocking order against a website is an extreme measure and remains an extreme measure, even when it pursues an aim recognized as legitimate by the ECHR. It only will have to be compatible with the Article 10, Paragraph 2, and only if it's based on a strict legal framework affording the guarantee of judicial review and in a very democratic society based on a strict legal framework affording uh, uh, actions that authorities need to consider among other aspects, such as rendering large quality, qu quantities of information inaccessible. And those are bound to substantially restrict the rights of internet users and have therefore a significant collector effect in our society. And then when we discuss all what the court has been issuing and guiding us in not only applying and how to apply the Article 10 and, and how to furnish that in the daily basis when implementing national legislation, we also have been working with member states just on the implementation of policies and how these policies become part of the reforms that they claim and get committed to. And in that view, when speaking today about Ukraine, I like to, 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 to touch upon a couple of issues that actually my services are working with and, 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 it, and part of the, of the daily uh, dealing with, with the authorities in the country. Ukraine has a diverse and dynamic media sector and its significant progress has been achieved, where have we seen, in some areas and only in the recent years. And that would include the issues that deal with the transparency of the media ownership, there is progress, development of public service broadcaster. There has been a lot of progress in cooperating with, with, it, with the national broadcaster and reforming the communal print media and access to public information in the country. So in these three aspects or avenues, we've been working a lot. However, we do acknowledge that Ukraine is facing serious challenges of propaganda and information disorder, including also disinformation. And the Council of Europe has been looking at these aspects carefully by addressing and providing support in transferring knowledge and skills and good practices and experience in fighting information disorder and other aspects. It is clear that the information disorder cannot be addressed in the absence of the serious limitations of freedom of expression in the country and therefore actions to combat should, it should be supported and not restricting that right. Also, access to reliable and trustworthy information produced by critical independent media actors has been a key to counter disinformation in the country through our activities. The Council of Europe implements cooperation programs in the country as part of the Action Plan for Ukraine 2018-2022, and which have been priorities set up in cooperation with the government. And that is the Action Plan as prepared prior to, to even, even a pandemic crisis. And we are implementing it through a project which is financed by the Council of Europe and the European Union in the country. The protection of the safety of journalists and ending impunity in crimes against them in Ukraine has been one of the areas that we have been working with the authorities. And we have identified that it requires setting up top priority in unity, uniting efforts to all stakeholders and advice that has been already passed to the authorities. Despite some positive changes, we still have witnessed rather a low efficiency in the investigation of those crimes against journalists and media actors and de facto often impunity of these crimes. We have provided also support for the creation of a special training course on protection of the journalists in cooperation with three law enforcement agencies in the country. And we are still working on making such trainings more sustainable 
and remain in the country even when the Council of Europe is not carrying out an activity as such. We also provide support in ensuring physical safety of journalists working in the conflict zone by intense training of war reporters and providing support to developing policies in their life insurance and addressing other problems. Ms. Abdiou? Yes, yes I'm I'll be sorry. done in, in, in one minute. Legal Great. and policy advice is being provided to the Parliament of Ukraine in aligning its media legislation on uh, the draft law on media and also work has been carried out in criminal legislation in the area of the protection of the journalists and professional activity. So while working on these areas, we have been closely working for the last four years with the Ukrainian public broadcaster, and we have been providing a lot of assistance and support to their activities. I'm not going further, but what I want to mention is that there have been two government agencies that have been established in March 2021 to counter disinformation and have been created uh, as centers for strategic communications and countering disinformation. It has to be mentioned that Ukraine has been making serious progress in reforming media sector and has shown certain achievements in guaranteeing the freedom of expression and also by setting up a response mechanism to coordinate follow-up to alerts published in the platform of the Council of Europe on the safety of journalists. Another good news is that uh, Ukraine has been one of the nine, first nine countries that has signed the Tromso Convention the access to, on the access to information. And uh, it's a convention that has now been enforced and we're looking forward to, to, to work with the country in terms of implementing the treaty law. And I'll close it here. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was um, yeah, very, uh, very extensive and very, very much in detail. I really appreciate it that you elaborated on what the, um, yeah, to what extent the Council of Europe is, um, yeah, trying to um, to support the Ukrainian authorities in their reform processes. So thank you, thank you very much. Um, I think there might be time for some questions at the very end. Um, and now I am very happy to give the floor to Ms. Nadia Zas. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Thank, thank you so you. much. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you so much. The floor is yours. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Of course. Dear colleagues, uh, greetings uh, from Ukraine, and um, it's a great pleasure for me to be here just now. I'm very grateful to you, Bas, Vocal Europe, and personally to Henri Malos for the organization of this very important for us for journalist webinar. And I'll try to be brief and pointed um the topic of human rights and democracy in ukraine from european perspective is always overshadowed by russia of course and the general notion is that since russia is a strategic um challenge to the eu and ukraine is in conflict with moscow any criticism of ukrainian internal developments and problems will play in the hands of kremlin but that is very um very weak and um ill sought position. With such um, with such approach in place, the EU loses its moral ground and seems caring only for its geopolitical interests that are um, priorities over values. Um, what is the difference between China turning blind eye to human rights violation in the allied nations like North Korea and Belarus and the European Union doing the same with regard to, uh, to Ukraine? And doesn't matter on whose side of political football plays uh, this or that regime, uh, its uh, wrongdoing should be called out and punished. And of course, about our um, our situation last February, as has been already said, three popular TV stations were silenced with extrajudicial sanctions. The Ukrainian government that in this case tried to silence uh, critical voices, naturally, um, naturally cited Russian narratives as an excuse to such undemocratic actions. And EU officials bought it, or at least pretended they did. The uh, US embassy even welcomed this um, censorship as if expression of views that some might interpret um, as sympathetic to Russia can be in a, in a democratic state uh, ground to shut the TV station down. And when governmental, sorry, and when governmental officials cite war as an excuse, they lie since from legal 
standpoint, um, Ukraine is not the state of war with the Russian Federation. And in Ukraine nowadays functions only peacetime legislation that doesn't entitle any institutions of silence media in an extrajudicial manner. Moreover, after the three TV stations were closed, the journalists came together and established a new one where they became owners of the legal entity. It was done to avoid any links with the previous owner, member of parliament, Taras Kazak, towards whom the government has some claims. But this, um, this new TV station, First Independent, was switched off an hour after it appeared on air um, to do this um, a later signed by deputy chair um, of security service to satellite service provider was enough. And I want to stress again, um, a simple letter citing some unclear national security concerns was enough to stop the broadcasting of the TV channel. And now it remains only in YouTube, but even there, uh, the Ministry of Culture, through lobbying with YouTube, a uh, European office in London, managed to ensure that viewers with Ukrainian IP address have limited access to our programs. What is it if not mere censorship? And, uh, of course, we, the journalists, request the Council of Europe, European Parliament, and the Association of European Journalists put pressure on Ukrainian government to ensure the restoration of violations rights of Ukrainian media, of course. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I hope we can solve this problem together. Thank you very much, Ms. Das, for your contribution. Um, I think I have to apologize because um, I haven't pointed out that Mr. Schufrich will join us a little bit later. Um, he has uh -huh. a delayed plane, so that is why I gave the floor immediately to Ms. Das. So he will join later on, um, yeah, as soon as he is connected uh, to, to the internet. Yeah. So thanks for your understanding. Um, so we will look forward to his contribution a little bit later. And uh, yeah, now I welcome uh, very much Ms. Alexandra Rakashenko. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for the invitation to this uh, web uh, conference. Uh, I'm a journalist of the website Strana UA. Uh, this is one of the most popular online media with over 24 uh, million visitors monthly. And uh, this website uh, has been blocked last month in the same illegal way like uh, the three national opposition news channels uh, earlier this year, uh, without any court orders, just with the stroke uh, of the pen of Ukraine's President Zelensky and uh, before decision of the National Defense and Security Council. Uh, the details on the reasons were not given and saying it was confidential. Uh, the government apparently doesn't like our website for criticism. I would like to share a little bit of history of our fight for freedom of expression. At first, uh, ex-president uh, Poroshenko falsified criminal cases against us and finally put Strana UA's editor-in-chief Igor Gujva to jail. After he was uh, freed, Gujva was forced to seek political asylum in Austria. He was granted it um, three years ago. This way, a European country confirmed political character of prosecution. Uh, current Ukrainian government continued the war against our weapons. Uh, we are not afraid to speak the truth and criticize the government for the mistakes in economic policy, lack of fight uh, against corruption, failure of the peace process in the east of Ukraine. Our reporters have exposed many of the country's most notorious scandals. For example, the Rotterdam Plus scandal, in which coal from eastern Ukraine was priced as uh, if it had been transported from Poland, allegedly defrauding consumers of more than one and a half billion over three years. Uh, the, pre the misappropriation of COVID uh, relief funding, and most recently, the apparent uh, diversion of a Ukrainian government plane intended for Ukrainians uh, fleeing from Afghanistan for the use of um, wealthy Afghans. We believe that our media, together with the three TV channels, were closed for these reasons, for criticism, and also probably because the president and his party faced a decline in popularity according to the opinion polls. So one month ago, 20th August, 
the National Council uh, for Security and Defense imposed sanctions against both the website and its editor-in-chief, Igor Guzhva. Access uh, to Strana UA was blocked in Ukraine. Uh, it is a di direct violation of the Constitution of Ukraine and the law on sanctions. The sanctions cannot be imposed against Ukrainian citizens without court decision. Moreover, according to the law, a media outlet cannot be a subject to sanctions. The government's actions are an illegal crackdown on independent, independent media and an attempt to destroy one of the biggest media by authorities' order. Internet providers have been ordered to block access to Strana UA website even before the presidential decree on sanctions, which was to provide at least some formal basis to introduce restrictive measures. This way, one of the biggest and most uh, popular Ukrainian online publication was blocked with no decision, no accusations, no um, investigation or evidence of illegal activity or propaganda. It is an unprecedented government's attack on journalists. The sanctions against Strana UA, uh, online media, threaten the press, free speech and mass media pluralism in Ukraine. This is the most draconian restrictions on opposition media seen in U Europe <clears throat> since the fall of the Soviet Union. Obviously, such kind of actions paving the way for a dictatorship. dictatorship. The president is, is accused of cleaning up the media landscape before a possible re-election in 2024 and eliminating possible com competitors. Besides, recently the parliament voted for so-called oligarch bill. Who is considered an oligarch under the law will be decided again by the National Defense and Security Council. In Ukraine, most of the TV channels and websites belong to the wealthy businessmen uh, who can be defined as oligarchs. So we can expect that more media outlets can be closed. Uh, there are concerns that the law will be applied selectively to help concentrate more power in the president um, Zelensky's own hands. Opposition says uh, a stronger judiciary and tougher anti-monopoly legislation would be more effective. So in this situation, we hope for support of the international community in our commitment to protect the freedom of speech in Ukraine. We are asking to influence the Ukrainian government in order to respect the freedom of speech, stop the pressure on our news outlet and our journalists, and let Strana UA restart its usual work. Thank you so much. Thank you very much uh, for your for your insight and um, yeah to get all the information from your perspective that is very uh, very enriching. Um, I'm sorry, my voice is a bit. Uh, I'm a, I have a cold, so I hope I, you can still all understand me. Um, um, so after uh, having had the uh, Ukrainian perspective, I'm very happy now to welcome uh, Alia Papagiorgiou, who's the vice president of the Association for European Journalists. And uh, I will give the floor to you. Yeah, thanks so much, Julia. And really great to see everyone here today. Um, uh, this is a vital conversation that we're having that we need to expand very much in the q and I'm looking very much forward to the Q&A to get to the point of where we come to um, some concrete, concrete, where we have some further ideas on how to progress from here. It's really sobering and uh, very appreciated to um, hear from Nadia and from Alexandra um, what the situation is like from their uh, in organizations and what it has been like for them. Um, the Association of European Journalists is uh, very, uh, you know, happy and uh, wanting to and uh, works very closely with the Council of Europe on the platform to promote the protection of journalism and safety of journalists um, and of course we'll continue our work there to be to assist as much as we can with these fundamental um, roles of democracy and uh, but you know these discussions we can have forever but the, the key thing is to look at where can we go in terms of um, promoting more solutions and more concrete um, next steps to help uh, Ukraine in this path for media freedom. 
uh, you've you heard a very analytical um, commentary from Ms. Abdil, which was very much appreciated, and we don't want to repeat the same things, but the, these rights are fundamental. Um, pluralism and media freedom are essential parts of democracy. It's been very interesting to see from the EU's point of side the past few years, the increase and the funds that are funneled towards uh, promoting because, of course, there have been some um, examples of how media freedom and pluralism are not as, um, you know, worry-free in Europe as well. But this is not the topic today. But um, um, I think it will be a good example to look towards how these funds and how the, the rule of law um, coming out of the media freedom work that the European Commission, the Council of Europe are doing. Uh, we have Commissioner um, uh, Thierry Breton looking towards a European Media Freedom Act in the next year where he calls any attack on these principles as an attack on the pact that unites the European Union itself. Uh, which have been forceful, but I still, it still seems to me that um, great examples like projects that the Council of Europe and the EU have brought together on the freedom of media in the Ukraine need to, um, you know, keep up their funds and keep up and increase even the role of these um, projects so that we can have um, more visible responses. Um, if you look at what is in the press at the moment, it does seem like the Ukrainian government doesn't see, want to acknowledge, of course, that all of this is that terrible. There are some statements from foreign ministers that say, of course, we have a free and independent press. This isn't an issue. And this is, you know, it's hard to, to um, say that that's the case when there are the independence of a public broadcaster is brought into question when um, the illegal closure of opposition media comes to fore uh, and these three stations. And as uh, our colleagues um, described to us, it's, the situation um, continues to be very concerning. Um, one thing that we have touched on that needs to also, um, that is a large part of what a global internet and a global um, media scape uh, is, turn, is, is kind of refining is this disinformation and Russia's role, as uh, Alexander rightly said, and uh, Sas Nadia, sorry, uh, rightly said. Um, it's interesting to see that the United Nations will, con will dedicate a whole week from... Uh, the 24th of October to the 31st, just on global media and literacy um, to look at this information and uh, literacy against this, but uh, this global machine of, of disinformation uh, obviously impacts Ukraine as well, if not the most, <laughs> but, oh, but it's uh, this is something that, um, that also needs a very high... Um, priority to how this can be uh, contrasted, how can we impact there? Um, if you look at the figures, the like the World Freedom, uh, Press Freedom Index, nothing seems to be dramatic. It's only one point where Ukraine has fallen in the last year from 96 to 97 out of 180 countries. But the, uh, but the facts and the reporting and uh, the cases that increase um, on the platform to promote the protection of journalists, the work that the European um, Centre on the Protection of Media Freedom is doing, that also, you know, is increasing uh, because they have more requests. So I very much and the mapping of media freedom that they're doing also at the European Center for Press and Freedia, Media Freedom um, is something, you know, that, so I look forward to the Q&A and maybe if, if there were to have be more concrete steps towards solutions, that would be 
amazing and more useful so we can continue the conversation in the future. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, Elia, for your liberation, also for um, reacting um, to Ms. Karchenko and uh, Ms. S's stories. Um, I, I would like uh, also the Council of Europe, so Ms. Uh, um, Ms. Abdia, also maybe if you want to, to comment on it, it would be really nice to, to have a reaction because I'm really happy that uh, the Ukrainian journalists that you're here today and that you shared your story. So it would be nice if uh, Ms. Abdia also yeah, could react to that. Also, all the other speakers, every speaker here is invited to react on um, what the others said. Okay, thank you. Thank you. In response to the call that uh, Ms. Karchenko uh, uh, um, presented earlier when, when discussing and in respect to also the echo that uh, Madame Papa Giorgio made. Uh, Council of Europe has been working with the Ukrainian authorities for quite a while right now. As we all know, um, the monitoring aspect, as mentioned before, it's depending and uh, it gives a view to, to the court's decisions and the guidance on, on the application of all implementing aspects of the Article 10 are based on the court's uh, 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 guiding uh, decisions uh, for, for not only Ukraine, but for all member states uh, of the Council of Europe. Therefore, the issue of the termination of broadcasting and sanctions, as mentioned before, against the opposition TV channels, as well as blocking websites in Ukraine, it's belie we believe should be approached in a very complex with other and complexity and, and, and compilation with the other existing challenges that Ukraine is passing today with regard to the freedom of expression um, uh, in the country. The Council of Europe for information of, to everybody has voiced these issues uh, uh, during this year as, as uh, claimed through the platform, but also through direct communication from, from representatives of, of uh, um, uh, of parties that has been has been part of, of, of these proceedings and has been providing a, a raising voice and discussions with the authorities vis-a-vis -vis as member states and obligations that they have towards the uh, European Convention on Human Rights. Moreover to that, the uh, Council of Europe has again reiterated and explained that these sanctions, when imposed, if imposed, should be in line with the principles of legality, transparency, and also objectivity. Moreover, the Secretary General will be discussing uh, and raising the issue of, of, of these aspects in her upcoming uh, report of the Secretary General on freedom of expression that will be, that is expected to come out soon, uh, following a raising of concerns and issues last February at the Committee of Ministers with respect to Ukraine on the issues that were touched upon from, uh, from the uh, colleagues, uh, previous speakers in this discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Abdio. Thanks. Um, I'm looking at the time, and uh, if you want to have a Q&A session, I will give the floor um, directly to our next speaker, which is uh, Mr. who is Mr. Achia del Grande. Thank you very much for being here. Hello, everybody. My name is Geert. I'm the founder of uh, ReStory. A uh, new uh, journalistic platform. I am uh, very uh, aware of the fact that uh, uh, what I will tell you uh, very shortly now uh, is is not uh, um, uh, perhaps immediately in relation to the situation in Ukraine. Uh, but I think there are some uh, general points of uh, freedom of press, which Henri uh, mentioned uh, when uh, at the start, when he was talking about uh, uh, media that don't get uh, chances when they are not uh, or are not considered as politically correct. Um, I, I listened. Uh, with much attention to what the European Council and Alia responded to the concrete cases of uh, Ukraine. Uh, but as I said, I, I, I would just uh, say something about the restory, why we started the, the platform, uh, because we wanted uh, to get attention for the need of a new economic system and uh, for the fact that uh, 
alternative media don't get uh, the chance to express themselves when they are um, uh, saying things that that are not um, uh, that are not coping with with the general uh, narrative and uh, I think in journalism uh, we also as a journalist have the responsibility to be more activist uh, for 40 years I, I have been a journalist and I was always trying to say a uh, journalist is only reporting, but the last uh, few years, I'm aware of the fact that uh, uh, there's a, a, a big need to be, um, to be also an activist as a journalist. I, I think uh, the, the examples of Ukraine show it very much uh, that any good journalist is an activist for truth and in favor of transparency. And we have some powers that are um, uh, stronger every day. I have the feeling that uh, uh, these powers are the opposite of what, what we have to do as a journalist. So our role as activists, I think, is, uh, is every day more important. And uh, we have to be, as a journalist, that's uh, my opinion, we have to be, as a journalist, more aware of that role uh, of activism. And I think the, the ladies from uh, uh, Ukraine uh, told it very well that, uh, that there is a great need and, and uh, the opposite powers are trying to prevent that. So... Um, I think the, the, the work that, uh, of which Alia and the European Council talked is uh, every day more important. And then one last thing I think that is very important to bear in mind also, because we talk about censorship, but we have to look also at the opposite direction. I mean, uh, political parties, uh, and it is not only in Ukraine, but even in Belgium, I think, Political parties are uh, influencing uh, in media. They have good relations with the, the, the great bosses of, of media. Of the, in Belgium, for example, there are only two big media groups that are representing all the big newspapers and magazines and broadcasting stations. And if you see how many influence some political parties have on that uh, broadcasting stations that is um, that means that uh, it, it is not censorship but it is the opposite way it is always pushing the same information into into the population so uh, that the critical voices um, haven't any chance to I, I'm not saying any chance is not not as as bad as in Ukraine of course but don't have the chance to to let to let hear uh, the opposite the opposite voice. So these are two things, in fact, that I wanted to 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 say and to add to this discussion. Apart from uh, what is going on in Ukraine and what the European Council and uh, the European the Association of European Journalists are doing, which is very important. Uh, so. These two uh, things, a part of that is uh, the role of journalists as activists. That's the first one. And the second one, to be aware of what's the opposite of censorship. Uh, it's mass influencing by some parties. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Reat. Uh, uh, that was really, um, yeah, really nice. Also to have your perspective, if you, uh, even if you um, did not talk about uh, Ukraine directly, which is uh, totally fine because we, it was really nice for, uh, yeah, what you have shared and also your personal experience as co-founder. Um, okay, then I don't know. With, is Mr. Schufrich already here? Um, I no. Because if he's not, then I will give the floor now to Mr. Wallace and we will wait a little bit more for Mr. Schufrich. So that's, that's okay, we still have time. Okay, uh, hello, Mr. Wallace, can you hear me? Is the uh, Wi Fi back to, to the UP? Uh, yes. To the EP? I, yes, okay. Hello, how, how are you doing? Yeah, we had a power cut in the European Parliament uh, this morning. Um, 
Maybe, maybe they didn't pay the bill. Uh, I'm not sure what happened. Um, anyway, listen, it's, it's been very interesting listening to the different speakers, uh, in particular uh, the women in Ukraine who were uh, at the cold face of the challenges facing the media in Ukraine. Um, I'm probably a bit surprised at the European Council, at the Council of Europe, uh, talking about the improvements in Ukraine because um, I, I, th I think it's very uh, must be hard to argue uh, for the improvements uh, right now. Uh, I mean, only in February, Kiev closed down. Uh, I think it was three media outlets accused of being too Russian friendly. Then in May, Kiev placed the main opposition leader uh, Medvedchuk under house arrest. And uh, in April 21, Ukraine arrested 60 demonstrators that are, were not even accused of engaging in violence, but instead expressing sympathetic views towards Russia. I mean, clearly, and I think that, that blogger, um, I can't, um, Anatoly um, Shari, I think is his name, um, I see he's had to leave the country and find shelter somewhere else. Um, it, it looks like the, the, uh, this guy... Andrei Yermak, um, he's, a, he's a powerful head in Zelensky's uh, office. And I mean, he's using the security services of Ukraine to censor media uh, that, that suits them. Uh, I mean, I, I'd be very worried about the lack of freedom in Ukraine for the press at the moment. And I'd also be very worried about uh, the EU response to it and their... Uh, failure to actually challenge Zelensky uh, on what's happening because uh, sadly I, I, I just see the geopolitical games going on as normal and uh, I don't see uh, the European Union calling a spade a spade when it comes to the lack of press freedom in Ukraine at the moment because of the, the, the Russian dimension. Now I mean listen uh, I think the journalists made it very clear that uh, Irrespective of, I mean, there's uh, the idea that uh, one side engages in this, in this information and the other doesn't is absolute nonsense. I mean, I, I find that both sides uh, engage in disinformation. And I mean, at the core of the anti Russian propaganda uh, is uh, this idea of, of, uh, of it's, it's presented as competing security interests, as a conflict between democracy and authoritarianism. I mean, uh, I find both sides a bit authoritarian, and uh, I mean this idea that it's good versus evil. Uh, I mean it's a bit like uh, the colonial times, and we had civilized the civilized versus uh, the uncivilized, and uh, what, uh, the colonialists uh, knew best what was good for the people. Uh, but obviously, we know that wasn't true. But I mean, uh, there's. The, the, I, I find a serious level of hypocrisy in, in the EU in dealing with places like Ukraine. I mean, uh, how come the EU never talks about uh, the likes of Algirdas uh, Palekis, uh, who is facing, who has been in prison in Lithuania, an EU state, uh, for speaking out? Uh, why doesn't the EU uh, talk about Mateusz Piskorski, who has been in prison in Poland for speaking out? I mean, uh, and uh, how much how much time have uh, the Council of Europe given to addressing the concerns of Julian Assange? Julian Assange is locked up for ten years for speaking the truth. This is a journalist uh, that exposed U.S. war crimes, and the European Union doesn't want to know about him. I mean, listen, if, if we need balance, we need we need. Uh, to you know, speak in a fair manner. I mean, we talk about freedom of expression and we talk about human rights, but we seem to be only interested in freedom of expression and human rights uh, for some and not for others. I mean, uh, there, there was a, the EU uh, lost the run of itself when Navalny was thrown in jail, but it wasn't near as worried about over 60 children being killed by the Israeli uh, attacks on Palestine a few months ago. And there's, there's a genocide taking place in Yemen and I don't see much interest in the human rights of, of the people of Yemen coming from the European Union. In actual fact, the European Union has failed to stop its member states from uh, sending 
untold amounts of arms to help the Saudis in the UAE to carry out their genocide, and they've supported them along with the Americans. But well, look at, I mean, uh, I, I, somebody asked, what can we do to improve media freedom in Ukraine? Uh, I would suggest that the EU start telling the truth about what's happening in Ukraine and put, a, put aside their anti-Russian uh, bias for a moment and just deal with Ukraine media and address it and challenge Zelensky's government uh, on the fact that he is actually uh, taught his walking roughshod over press freedom in Ukraine at the moment. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Wallace. Um, because you you just said that you are um, yeah upset, so to say, with the with the Council of Europe, but also with the European Union's um, yeah lack of reaction or with the hypocrisy um, going on. Um, I was just wondering whether yeah I would like to give the floor um, to Aldita again to to the Council of Europe, maybe to to react. Um, on that because so we actually heard earlier on that there was indeed uh, an improvement going on in ukraine so i would yeah very much appreciate if she uh, reacted to that yeah well it's mostly just to clarify because mm -hmm. what i mentioned before is that um due to the diverse and dynamic media sector the uh, progress we have seen in the areas where we have been working with the authorities through the projects and through the reform support has been noticed as a progress, achieved progress in the areas of working the towards the transparency of media ownership in the development of the public broadcaster and also in the reform concerning the, the communal print media and access to public information. And that is supported with the fact that uh, through our project, for four years, as mentioned before as well, we have been able to, to support the authorities, a member state of the Council of Europe in carrying out activities on, uh, on respect to increasing their ability to, to also, for example, uh, um, refer to referring to the law on media, the draft law on media, to make that law, not just law for one side, but for everybody, to uh, address issues of the criminal legislation and procedural law in the area of protection of journalists, that that piece of legislation needs needs to be to have a, another outlook as well to uh, assist the Ukrainian public broadcaster in um, in in carrying out its tasks in an unbiased way and as well and most transparent by also having and providing a neutral and balanced coverage of the elections of the last year, which were also positively. Uh, and uh, uh, recorded by the OEC and ODIL, uh, ODIR's monitoring, and also to, to address issues of their national minorities and internally displaced persons, um, to, to carry out the treaty law obligations vis-a-vis -vis what they have signed on the Trumpson, Trumpson Convention, and as well as what they have agreed through the association agreement with the European uh, Union, where the, uh, the uh, European Union Association Agreement in the country which gradually they, are, they have to initiate the approximation of legislation vis-a-vis -vis the directive on the audiovisual and uh, um, uh, services. Uh, what else? And also progress uh, noted because of the, the two centers that were mentioned before being established. And Ukraine is one of those countries that in the platform for the safety of journalists has created its own system mechanism for responding and uh, when looking at that and comparing with other 47 member states there, I think that we, we, see, we do see the, the differences, but that's what I listed as a mirror of the products and results and work done. And it's not an evaluation of the political situation and the level of freedom, uh, freedom of expression in the country. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Anita, for, for clarifying that. Um, highly appreciate it. Um, I would like to give the same question to, to Nadia and to Alexandra, actually, because uh, Mr. Wallace said that he would wish for Council of Europe, but also for the EU, uh, because he's speaking here as an MVP, that he wished the EU to, to be more vocal on the issue and to, uh, I think you put it this way, to, to tell the truth on, on what is going on. Do you think that would help or you know, what is your opinion here? Yeah, we try to, to do... Um 
every possible uh, actions from us, from journalists to uh, help for freedom of speech in Ukraine. And I remember how one British MP MP said, right, on the airs that I hosted, freedom of speech uh, cannot be limited by anything. Otherwise, it's no longer freedom of speech. And even for insults on the air, a politician can be sued, but not a TV channel or TV channel or TV host. No one will close the media in those studios, a scandal took place. And you know that we have a problem with the government, problems with the government uh, since the fall of 2019. We again had to turn to European politicians for support because after the shelling of uh, 112 TV channel from the granite launcher, after attempts to revoke the news one license, the uh, deprivation of the digital uh, license of 112 TV channel, we again traveled and will travel to Brussels and Strasbourg. And uh, we made a Kiev Brussels teleconference with the participation of MPs. And then uh, it helped us repeal the attack of the authorities, but we couldn't even imagine that Zelensky would go to such a legal house as the introduction of sanctions. Again, a citizen of Ukraine and legal entities of Ukraine, and of course, against us uh, journalists. And you know that for one part of uh, our Ukrainian societies, we are a journalist of closed TV channel like an enemies. And that's why it is, was awful when my colleagues um, uh, try, and today they try to find work, but it's impossible because our colleagues from another TV channels try to stop it and said, oh, you are Russian uh, agencies, go away. And that's all. And of course, uh, we have only one chance, a chance to change the situation, to um, ask about, for help uh, European uh, colleagues, European politicians for support uh, because Ukraine wants to be a member of European uh, uh, Union and that's why we need to declare European values. And I hope that we can solve this problem. And of course, I'm thankful to everyone for your support, for uh, good words and to understand in the this situation in Ukraine just now. Yeah, I still wanted to give the same question and also the floor to, to Alexandra Kashenko. If you yes, want to. I, I agree, fully agree uh, with what uh, Nadia said. Uh, our website uh, also appealed to uh, European organizations, international uh, community to help uh, to influence our government uh, to be <laughs> more um, uh, open and uh, not to use these uh, tools to close uh, media outlets. This is absolutely illegal. And uh, we are waiting from uh, Europe some um, reaction. And I would like to remind that, um, for example, in Russia, that is uh, considered to be a, a dictatorship or country, uh, they they don't even um, they uh, didn't invent like this uh, tool to close uh, opposition media outlets. They uh, label, for example, uh, opposition media as foreign agents, but they still uh, they are still existing. Uh, but here in Ukraine, we are uh, considered to be more democratic country, of course. But uh, government the government closed fully closed media outlets. What is this? This is not a democracy. This is a dictatorship. This is a way to dictatorship. So this is, uh, as Nadia said, uh, Ukraine uh, declare uh, an, ins an, an aspiration uh, to be a part of uh, European Union. So we must follow uh, the values, the European values. But we are not. Uh, so much. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's a shameful situation. Mm -hmm. Yes, I understand a very difficult um, yeah, situation that uh, that you're in. Um, I just received the information that Mr. Shufrish is uh, still not there. Um, so we don't know whether he will still make it because apparently he gets stuck um, in the traffic. So I will keep you posted on that. That means that we have more time than expected for questions and answers and Q&A session. Also questions um, yeah, among the speakers. 
I already asked uh, Ms. Sas and Karshenko to, to react uh, on what Mr. Wallace already pointed out. But of course, I, will also, I would like to also give um, Mr. Del Grande and um, Ms. Papa Giorgio the opportunity to speak up, to speak up on that before um, yeah, asking the audience whether they have questions. So the question was whether the, um, whether the European Union or Europe in general should be more vocal um, on, on what is happening in Ukraine or how the journalists uh, can be supported, how to deal with this situation. Um, yeah, maybe uh, Ms. Papa Giorgio, Alia can start. Sure. Sorry about that. I mean, I'll just be no very words. quick. I don't have much more. I see hands are going up, so it, it would be better to get to the discussion as well. Uh, the only point I wanted to make is um, for the next the, the project that is uh, ongoing with the. If I can um, ask a question to the Council of Europe, so Ms. Abdil, who has been so generous with us today, um, how is there a uh, what is the next process like? Like, a, what is the next round of uh, funding and continuation of this project with the the state um, of Ukraine? And is there a, is it a specific plan until um, for the next four years or for the next four years? Because I know that the previous one was a very uh, tight time wise. A project so if that continues um that would be great does she also think that more funding could be of use there and then um yeah looking forward to the discussion i wouldn't have anything else Thanks. for now i maybe have one question um, and then afterwards, I will give the floor to um, to the Council of Europe. Sorry, I just want to uh, let Rea to ask his question first. Please okay. go ahead. Regarding to this, um, I, I, I think in every country, and certainly in Belgium, it is also the role of uh, of our media and our journalists uh, to talk about this problem. But we have. Uh, that that is very difficult because uh, if you you see the two big press groups in Belgium, they are fighting each other and they are uh, looking for readers and it's all about clickbaits, but serious questions like the censorship of media in Ukraine. Uh, the 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 common reader in Belgium is 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 not aware of that because the Belgian journalists don't pay attention to this. Big problem. I, for me myself, I am very surprised to hear about all what is going on in Ukraine. To hear uh, the, the the witnesses of of uh, uh, Alexandra and 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 Nadia and Nadia, what they are telling us now today. But in in our Belgian media, we we don't have any attention for that, and that is also a big problem. But I don't know how to resolve it. But it, it's it's certainly a problem, and that's not only as as uh, Mick said, that's not only about Ukraine, but also about Poland or uh, any other country. This is in 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 the big media of the the big press groups. These are all ch subjects that don't come to to the attention of the great public, and that is that is, yeah, we we have to regret it very much. But I don't know how to resolve it. Maybe a European Council could also stress this uh, when talking to, to big press groups in European countries. I don't know. Okay, thank you very much. I see we have um, then two or three questions um, uh, to, the, to the Council of Europe. Um, yeah, please go ahead. I will give you the floor now to, uh, to respond to them. Well, prior to, to, well, I will answer to the first question yes. and then uh, Mr. De Grande's intervention, I will just add more information on, on, on Great. The, his Thanks. point. Um, with respect to the current Council of Europe programming, as I mentioned before, this is an intervention, a program, a project which is part of a bigger program of the Council of Europe with the uh, European Commission um, or in, in, in Ukraine that has been ongoing for the last three years. Um, as a matter of fact, the, the current ongoing one 
has been extended with no cost extension until the end of this year because it was supposed to be finalized in, in June, mid-June uh, of, of uh, 2021. And currently we are looking at the possibilities of, of a, a follow-up uh, project. But I'll be very honest with you, given the current situation uh, of what's going on in the country, given the, 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 the move of, of certain aspects, also the legislation, the certain commit, new commitments of the country vis-à-vis -vis international law and, and international institutions, uh, we plan, even we have a project, we plan to do an assessment of needs which is a, a measuring of, of, of the baselines where the country is vis-a-vis -vis their obligations and, 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 and the current situation, political situation, considering the political situation as well in the country and, and what is all reported these days and discussed even today. Um, so that's our plan and um, to, to do a, re, a refreshment of the needs and baselines before we go step two, which is a follow-up project with the, uh, with the uh, Ukraine, who and should be funding that, that's another question. Uh, we usually are in partnership with the European Commission on, on, on interventions and such, but we will also look and seek our own uh, financing uh, of the Council of Europe for its member states as well. Uh, part of, of, of projects, um, beneficiaries and target groups will be, will be uh, media outlets and, and civil society as well. Now, with regard to Mr. De Grande's uh, uh, intervention in Panorama, that you know what's going on, I like to add also that we didn't speak much that uh, how much the COVID has affected its, itself, also the the uh, the media in Ukraine, and how it has resulted to a shrinking advertising market for the media itself, how the closure of retail trade points and publishing houses and termination of publishing of about 200 newspapers and magazines has been uh, you know, ongoing, and that is due to the COVID. How the pandemic has also had a severe impact on the local broadcasters, and how the, uh, you, uh, the problem as according to the Ukrainian Institute of Mass Information, 62 violations of freedom of speech were recorded in 2020. And today, as far as today, up to today, about 30 have been reported for 2021 are related to the lockdown imposed due to the coronavirus and, and pandemics and the denial to access for journalists to local government sessions and attacks on journalists during the lockdown inspections, etc. So maybe this also could be added to the grim also view of, of, of the Ukraine uh, that we are, we are discussing today and commenting. And for sure, this will be considered in the Council of Europe's assessment of the of the baseline that we will be carrying out for a, a next step to address right reform and priorities of the country through a, an assistance program. Thank you. Thank you so much for answering the first questions that came already up. Um, I see that one of our one someone of our audience also has raised their hands. I would give the floor to. Uh, ah, it's Mr. Crawford. Hello. Hello. Nice to see you. And you uh, yeah, please, uh, please go ahead. We're looking forward to your question. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, I have a question. I think that I was listening to all the speakers, and I think that the key issue here, uh, being watching on what happens here in, in Ukraine, in Belarus, in Russia, wherever, the key question is where is this borderline between the full freedom of speech and uh, limitations of the freedom of speech because we know all that uh, there are some informations which can be harmful and this is the main argument of, of the authorities here there are some arguments also in the european union about the extreme right uh, parties for example which are saying things which can be harmful to people so shall we and this question applies to any any media in ukraine in Ukraine, being it uh, Russian, for Russian, Ukrainian speaking, Russian speaking, any media in Belarus or any media in, in European Union, shall we limit it in a way uh, any harmful information or harmful speeches, or we just give the full freedom and we see what happens? I think part of this role is accomplished in the European Union, for example, about, by self-control of media and by public control. But if those mechanisms do not work, like it happens in Belarus, Russia and Ukraine, how can we, how can we deal with this? Thank you very much. 
Um, so you said that this question would be for everybody, but I think we would still have to direct it to, to someone to to answer it. Um, I don't know, is, uh, Mr. Wallace, are you still here because your camera is switched off? Because I think that would be very interesting to... Ah, yes. Hi. Hello. <laughs> uh, because I think that question uh, would be very interesting to, to be answered um, also by you. So the Sorry. question... Yeah, so the... Um... Mm -hmm. so, sorry, give me the question again because I actually just missed it. Sorry. Yeah, so no worries. So the question basically was Mr. Corput asked the question that uh, that there's actually yeah, some kind of a borderline that at some point information can be also can indeed be harmful, whether uh, freedom of press is not unlimited, whether there is at some point um, yeah, a limit to be given to freedom of press in some under some conditions. And well, how to define uh, it, yeah, because there is indeed this gray I, area. I, um, if you, I mean, one of your speakers in particular, I'm sorry that uh, I missed his name, uh, but he, he was speaking about the mainstream media, the two big blocks in Belgium. And um, I mean, sadly, the mainstream media have become a big problem. And um, we're not getting... Um, unbiased news uh, a lot anymore and um, now listen the, there's the, there's obviously new, um, new forms of news developing uh, but a lot of if, if you look at the mainstream media even in my own country Ireland for example right um, the people who own the press generally speaking have a lot of money and the people who own the press have a vested interest in the status quo a lot of the time and they're pretty reluctant to, to challenge it. And then, uh, for example, in Ireland, uh, we have the main, the, pa the, the, the established papers and main papers. Um, they depend on advertising from big companies uh, to make their money. Uh, they don't make their money from sales of newspaper. They make it mostly from advertising. And uh, like, for example, in Ireland, we have a lot of U.S. companies, and the, the papers are, are, would be very reluctant to take an anti-U.S. position on any foreign affairs issue in Ireland because it would cost them money. And so what we have then is we have, for example, the mainstream media in Ireland and much right across Europe uh, are reluctant to challenge U.S. imperialism because American business uh, is so strong and they depend on us uh, for the revenue. And then, obviously, uh, there's probably uh, a strong element of Atlanticism as well running through the mainstream media in Europe. So, I mean, limiting uh, press freedom, um, I wouldn't be on for it myself. Uh, I, I find the lack of transparency in how governments operate, how the European Union operates. Uh, to be problematic. Some people might think that Julian Assange uh, was a, uh, overstepping the mark by revealing evidence of US war crimes in their war uh, adventures, and that uh, some people think he should be in prison for doing it. Well, I don't think so. I think Julian Assange uh, is a hero, and I think he should be free. And uh, I think it's an absolute disgrace that the European Union has been so silent on the refusal uh, for Julian Assange to be allowed uh, to work as a journalist. Uh, his human rights are being uh, denied. Uh, he's locked up for telling the truth. So, I mean, I'm actually a great... I, I, I think the world would be a safer place if we all told the truth, uh, especially in the media. But unfortunately, I, I, I find the lack of... Uh, that truthful approach in the media to be a lot more dangerous than the alternative. Thank you. Okay, thanks. So from that, I take that you are actually then rather in favor of absolute um, yeah, freedom of, of press, so to say, um, and that you criticize the lack of transparency. I still, yeah, I would ask you... Uh, I, uh, I am. I would be totally in favor of uh, one hundred percent freedom of the press. Uh -huh. Okay, and um, then I would like to give uh, the floor to um, Alia Papa too, um, uh, to to comment on the same question.
Apologies. Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, I would be uh, along the same lines, of course, um, but uh, as in uh, complete uh, freedom of the media and the press is uh, invaluable. Um, it is, uh, it has been a major concern and a rising, you know, misinformation and the right and the whole not to use a Trumpism, but I'm about to fake news a situation. Um, that it, it that, um, the, the use of the internet for. Uh, political, the democratic uh, uses has changed. Um, it has changed. It has. Uh, we see the influence. We see the kind of. I still see that there is a wave going across the world of that. We're still kind of in that sphere of how disinformation can be used. There are some um, regulations and oversight boards, for example, for Facebook that are coming up that are looking at how do we create a legal structure that um, democracies are more in control of what goes on online than tech companies. This is uh, obviously a, something that, that is... Um, unbalancing the situation and you see the reflection in democracy but um, other than this it's it, it's a fine line and the freedom is the is the prior you know the primordial need um, just going back on before we mentioned um, the truth coming from EU and uh, in terms of what would help Ukraine in the next steps it's true that um since this was supposed to be just coming to the European Commission, actually, it, it was supposed to be a more um, political European Commission. And then in the end, when um, we've seen that uh, Ukraine hasn't been as in the forefront as it could be from um, the heads of the EU institutions. So that's also something where I think um, Alexandra and the uh, Nadia have been pointing towards saying that this, this is something that hasn't helped uh, in this situation and hopefully that trajectory will um, will change. But uh, misinformation has been, you know, it's been documented how the amounts of um, funds and, mo and money, especially coming from Ukraine's closest neighbour, go into this technical and digital and hybrid kind of going towards attack mode um, in the last decade. So this is also something that um, someone mentioned that it's geopolitical games, but it needs to be more transparent as soon as possible to help all the aspects. If that makes sense, I'm trying to kind of combine the, the, some of the topics together. Thanks. Um, thank you very much. Um, I see that the time is, uh, yeah, almost has almost um, run up. Um, before I ask every speaker very shortly in a very short statement, just to yeah to, to wrap up uh, what their what their position is, um, in order to 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 conclude um, this webinar, um, is there are there any other questions before we um, follow to. Yeah, to the wrapping up, because I don't see a rising hand. Let me check. Nope. Okay. Um, unless, um, I'm sorry, Mr. Belgrande, unless you uh, have another contribution um, to the question, because I find the question of uh, Mr. Corput very, uh, very interesting, where to draw the fine line and how whether um, yeah, freedom of expression is absolute, even in the case of um, yeah, harming uh, different parties. Otherwise, we will just wrap it up. That's okay. That's okay? Okay, good. Um, then uh, I suggest we make it in the, uh, in the structure of the webinar and the line of order. And uh, I'm very happy to give the floor one last time in the webinar to uh, the Council of Europe.
But okay. Yeah, you can speak. Great. <laughs> So, but basically, uh, in, in in terms of to to wrap it up uh, from our side, is that we will be uh, you by now have received the the uh, presentation I have sent, and it's actually it it feels good as a as a moment because it would clarify certain aspects of uh, questions that were raised later on today, and that of the standards, how far we should draw the line between of the legality of the issues and the criteria to be filled. It's part of the PowerPoint presentation that we address the issue, this issue how the court has been guiding by the, uh, its own decisions. And the last is the areas where the Council of Europe has identified so far in terms of interventions and programming for its future um, uh, program, projects in, in Ukraine. Um, most importantly is that we do have a clear vision for, for the moment uh, where to point more and put focus in terms of, of priorities as far as concerns implementation of the treaty law aspects. And we do have an intention to look at in thorough way uh, aspects of the country's legislation and needs to improvement when it comes to the levels of freedom of expression, censorship and, uh, and transparency in the ownership of media. Thanks. <laughs> then, um, Miss Nadia Zas, it's your turn. Uh, you're still muted. Yeah. I'm so sorry. Yeah, I'm so grateful. And I want to say thank you for everybody because it's really important for us, for journalists. And I want to say, of course, uh, the team of our TV channel, of, of our three TV channels, has never depend on the opinion of the authorities or group of influence. Throughout the period of our activity, we work systematically and with a high quality every day in order to realize the right of the Ukrainians to access information. But unfortunately, in modern Ukraine, journalists cannot exercise their rights to a professional uh, profession and citizens cannot receive honest and objective information. And uh, this is due to the uh, authorities uh, which disregards the law and our constitution, Ukrainian constitution, and those and close uh, dissent and media upon the phone call. But we did not uh, give up and um, continue to do our job. And we have our own audience uh, that watched us on YouTube, Facebook, and Telegram, despite the ban. And our team has solved the necessary professional uh, skills to convey honest and objective information to the citizens of Ukraine. But of course, uh, the authorities has deprived us of the opportunity to broadcast our position on television and are trying to block us on the internet, interfering with our activities um, in every possible way. But um, I understand that today the freedom of speech in the country depends on our joint action and that's why I'm so grateful and I want to say that um, such discussions it's only one chance to uh, change the situation not in Ukraine of course but the whole situation with the freedom of press uh, um, on our in our uh, uh, nowadays yes Uh, Ms. Karshenko. Uh, thank you, everybody, uh, for having me today. And um, uh, I would like to uh, see <laughs> the positive changes uh, in um, Ukraine very soon in media, regarding to media and freedom of speech. Uh, by the way, uh, I have read today in the morning that uh, in European uh, Parliament uh, will be created a commission that will study the situation uh, with freedom of speech in Ukraine. And uh, of course, the reason for such a proposal was the impose, impo, uh, sanctions by the Ukrainian government uh, against uh, a number of media outlets, including uh, my website, Strana UA. Oh, sorry for the voices. Uh, and all of them are listed in the draft resolution as victims of repression uh, applied without any legal proceedings. Uh, 
So I would like uh, to hear from European Parliament some decisions uh, that will um, help to, our, to, to, to media in Ukraine. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for, for being here. Um, Ms. Papagiorgio, Alia? Uh, I feel like I spoke too much today, so uh, no. <laughs> I'll, I'll summarize. But um, I just wanted to say, of course, we'll continue as much as we can to work with uh, on the platform to promote the protection of journalism and safety of journalists that we do with the Council of Europe. If uh, there is ever anything we can do for uh, the journalists themselves as well, that's part of the role of the Association of European uh, journalists in Belgium, or if they have any other um, issues, and um, yeah, to continue the discussion if we can. Uh, that I think that in itself is uh, is something is a is a great uh, step. Thank you so much. Thank you for for being here with us, um, Mr. Gerd de Grande. Uh, yeah, f first of all, thank you for. Uh... Uh, having the opportunity to participate in the debate. Uh, thank you also to Nadia and Alexandra for having learned me a lot more about the situation in Ukraine and how uh, the opposition uh, to the press is, uh, is working there. And I think uh, a very important thing is to say that, uh, I, I repeat it, that the journalists in uh, nowadays have to be activists and also that uh, I think it is very important that uh, in other European countries uh, the mainstream media as uh, explained uh, Mick um, have to take uh, the responsibility to uh, yeah to, to, to talk about the situations and uh, have to take the responsibility not to be retained by their uh, financial um, by by the people who are are supporting them financially. So uh, uh, it is very important, I think, that you see in every European country uh, that is the positive side that you see uh, small alternative media like Restory is also one. Um, to come next to the mainstream media to let to to let hear another voice, and this way we try to contribute to um, uh, a system in which uh, uh, issues like the censorship in Ukraine uh, can be put more into the attention of the people here. Thank you. Thank you very much for having shared um, yeah, your experience. I think it was very valuable uh, within in this context um, too. And uh, last but not least, um, thank you very much, um, um, Mr. Mick Wallace, for uh, being here with us. Um, the floor is yours for some final uh, remarks. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'll be very brief. Uh, just uh, in light of the fact that the EU has an association agreement with Ukraine at present, uh, I would suggest that the Ukraine, Ukrainian journalists that have spoken here, that you put a list together of your complaints and major concerns at the moment uh, ar around the lack of freedom of the press in your country and give them to the European Union, give it, uh, whether it's the Commission or uh, the Council, uh, European External Action Service, uh, ask for them to be presented to the Zelensky's government uh, for him to answer and say, what, are, what have you to say about these restrictions on the media in your country? That's what I'd like to see happen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, um, yeah, time is uh, up. We are already eight minutes over. Um, thank you very much for staying a little bit longer um, with us. Uh, thank you very much for being here with us today. I really, or we really appreciate that you all took the time um, yeah, to, to exchange. I really enjoyed uh, to have many different perspectives on the topic of freedom of press that we got the chance to talk about Ukraine. Um, yeah, I don't want to uh, <laughs> lose any more words. Maybe some final remarks from Mr. Malus. Yes, the stage please. is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Julia, and thank you for your excellent work. 
uh, for, uh, for this debate. And I think uh, you both and Boca de Europe are very proud of, of you and what you achieve. I would like to thank the speakers. I would just make a very brief comment on two points. The first point is to say that we see the tendency today in Ukraine, in Europe, everywhere, and I think it's, it's important so for the Council of Europe, they are aware, to see that the disinformation, which is a reality, but is becoming maybe an excuse for some governments, for some whatever they are, to try to uh, ban uh, and to limit the freedom of press. Uh, and this, this is a real danger. Uh, and sometimes this uh, disinformation, where they the create disinformation task force or whatever, uh, it's interesting to see what's behind this. And sometimes behind this disinformation task force, task force, disinformation uh, unity agency, you see that there are also some, some people who have some interest and will make themselves disinformation. So we should be very, very careful. I think the example given by uh, uh, Mike Wallace about uh, about Julian Assange. Of course, it's an extreme case, but it's I think it's a, it's an interesting case to see uh, where disinformation and where freedom of expression can be can compete. My second point and last uh, would be would be about, about Ukraine. For people who know me, I've been on Maidan. Uh, the Russian authority put me on the blacklist, so I cannot be considered as a, as as an agent of, of Russia, but. Uh, I see that uh, in Ukraine, and when we listen to, to what we hear today, there is a tendency to use it so, uh, the Russian influence or interference as an excuse to limit freedom of press and freedom of expression. And this is a danger. Uh, and I think the, the Ukrainian government, uh, who maybe have some goodwill, I don't know, but should be aware of that. Because uh, if they do that, I think the next president, the next government will may, may do that on the other, other side. So we should really put freedom of the media, freedom of the press as a key issue, as a key value. And there should be no limitation, except, of course, what is by, by justice or by, for other reasons. We should be really conscious, because I see with the example of Ukraine in a, in a, in a conflict situation with the possibility of political limitations, which are not, uh, I would say, not correct. And, and finally, I think the, the suggestion of Mike Wallace is very interesting, but the, the, press, uh, the press in Ukraine addressed to the European institution and to the parliament, and very pleased that the parliament uh, may launch, as I hear, an inquiry about the situation of freedom of press in Ukraine. This could be a concrete, concrete answer to the, to the debate that we have today, and we are very proud of uh, Europe and you both to have contributed to that. So thank you to everybody and have a, have a beautiful day. And I say thank you very much again to the speakers. And thank you very much for your moderation, Julia. Bye. Thank you very much, bye. everybody. Have a nice day. <laughs> thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a nice day. You too.